So arguments are inferences, and inferences are based on facts. Inferences do not replace facts, and facts themselves are not arguments. Uh, facts are not... The fact that inferences aren't facts doesn't mean that inferences aren't true, but uh, inferences are what we do with the facts. So in my original example, the Smilodon skull that's found in the bottom of the La Brea tar pits, that object is a fact, and the argument that it ended up there because it was trying to uh, take advantage of an easy meal when another animal was trapped in the tar pits. That is not a fact, that is an inference. And it, specifically, it's a causal inference. So we look at that fact and we say, how did this fact get here? Uh, looking at it in the context of all the other available facts, the most likely cause seems to have been that it was trying to uh, attack an animal that was stuck in the tar pits, and that's how it itself got stuck, and that's why its skeleton is right next to the fossilized skeleton of its potential prey. So the inferences we come to are going to depend on the facts we have available, hopefully. If now Otherwise, we're using confirmation bias when we start with an inference and then we go looking for facts that support it. So it's extremely important that we have all the facts, and no matter what sources you use, no matter how many great peer-reviewed academic articles you have access to that have collected all of this data, all of those facts are still going to necessarily be incomplete. We're always going to lack for something. We're never going to be able to see every potentially relevant fact. So it matters a lot what our sources are, and it matters that we collect all the facts we can, even if those facts are anomalies, even if those facts seem to be counter-evidence to the claim we want to make. We still want to take in all those facts if we're making an argument of inquiry because those anomalies, those, those facts that don't quite fit our inferences, those make us go back and rethink those inferences and, and reword our claims to make them actually work better to fit reality rather than just being uh, convincing and easily memorable. And I've already used the example of the World War II bombers that were uh, coming back to the runway after a bombing run uh, filled with bullet holes on the tips of the wings and in the tail and even in the center of the plane in the fuselage. Uh, but they weren't coming back with holes in the engine and they weren't coming back with holes in the cockpit and they weren't coming in with uh, holes in the back part of the fuselage where the bombs were stored. And those bullet holes that came in on those planes those were facts. Those were uh, independently verifiable pieces of information. And what people did with those facts was that they reasoned a cause for why those facts were there. They reasoned that this is where the planes were getting hit the most, and they wanted to put armor somewhere on the plane, but they couldn't cover the entire plane in armor because it would be too heavy. So they decided, we value those areas where those bullet holes are more. We're going to choose to put the uh, armor there, and so they, they adopted that policy, or they were about to adopt that policy based on those facts, which were real facts that were independently verifiable, but the inferences they made about what was causing them and uh, which parts of the plane to value more and where to put the armor, uh, those inferences were based on the available facts, but it took the mathematician Abraham Wild to realize that the facts that were coming back were not all the facts that there were. Uh, the fact that the engines were coming back without holes didn't necessarily mean the engines weren't getting shot, it just means the only planes coming back were the ones with functional engines. So he was able to recognize what facts were missing and he was able to revise his inferences accordingly. So just having access to facts is never going to be entirely enough. We always have to be aware about how our inferences are automatically generated. They're system one, they're coming from our non-reflective cognition. And we want to treat them the same way we treat the bat and ball problem in the cognitive reflection test. Uh, taking that first answer is only a first step. You want to then say, well, wait a second, uh, let me verify that first. Let me see what other inferences this generates and f ask myself if these inferences match all the facts. So when we look at the fact, we also want to look at how we're looking at the fact. We want to be aware of our own consciousness of those facts and see uh, what we may be noticing, what we may not be noticing, what we may be emphasizing or focusing on. And if we're focusing on one thing, that means we're not necessarily focusing on something else. And if we're making one inference, that might mean that we're ignoring other possible inferences. For example, if you look at this series of markings, the first thing that probably pops in your mind is the letters A, B, C. 
and that's what most people see when they see this. And when you look at these, you probably the first thing that pops into your mind is probably 12, 13, 14. But of course, you probably see where I'm going with this. The two lines in the middle could be a B, and it could be a 13. And the, what pops out at our uh, awareness immediately is based not on the shape of the lines themselves, or not just the shape of the lines themselves, but also the context in which we find them, the other lines that frame them. And so changing the way we see the data, in this case, those shapes, or the, the repetition of that shape in the top and in the bottom box, uh, those lines that you see are facts. I can see them, you can see them, other people watching this video can see them. We can all independently verify the shape of those lines, but we can't all independently verify that those lines are necessarily a B or necessarily a 13. And that is because it, whether it's a B or a 13 is a matter of definition, and we have to decide what we're using to define it. Should it be the, the fact that the, the lines are disconnected from each other? In which case we'd say, well, they're uh, not one unified letter. But that inference might be something that people, or that definition might not be something people agree on, so you'll have to make that argument later. But the facts themselves are not that that is a B or a 13. You can't say that's a 13 and that's a fact. You can't say it's a B and that's a fact. All you can say is those are lines and they look like kind of like a B and they kind of look like a 13. But as we are aware of what we're looking at, we also want to be aware of what's around it and how the frame shifts the way we interpret it. Now, if I showed you this four letter word that's missing the third letter, and I asked you what the, the missing letter was. An idea might pop into mind really quickly. But if I preface that by saying, before you eat, fill in this missing letter. I think I can probably guess what letter pops into your mind. And I bet it's not the same letter that would have popped into your mind if I said this. After you wash your hands, fill in the missing letter. The same three letters with the missing third could be either soup or soap. And probably a 50-50 chance you would guess one or the other if you just saw the letters in isolation. But by making you think about eating and showing you a dinner plate, or by showing you a sink, uh, notice that neither of these pictures in the background had the thing that the word could spell. Uh, you don't see soap in this picture, and you didn't see soup in the uh, previous picture. But all of those other elements that you saw uh, formed a pattern and to be coherent with that pattern, uh, you would probably pick U for the word soup in the previous picture and A for the word soap in this picture. Remember the example of the words that go with needle uh, that, that I asked you to remember in the a previous uh, thought experiment. And the word needle wasn't in that word list, but it seemed like you may have heard it because it was coherent. So this is called associative coherence. I'm using your associative coherence to lead you to see the same letters with the same blank in different ways based on what's around it. And it's a each of these is a different frame, and by choosing that frame, I'm deliberately priming you to think of one thing or another. I'm priming you to think of a particular pattern rather than another equally valid pattern to go with this fact and to shape the inferences that you have about this fact. Now priming has a lot to do not only with what we see, what we pay attention to in the environment, but also what we think we see or thought we saw. Uh, as in the case of the associative coherence with the word needle, you didn't actually hear the word needle in that, uh, that word group, but you may have thought you did because it fit that pattern. An early example of priming came quite by accident a few decades ago at the Rotterdam Zoo in the Netherlands. A very rare red panda escaped from the zoo one day. They're apparently very good at getting out of cages and that sort of thing. They're kind of a, close to raccoons. They're called red pandas as, uh, as slightly inaccurate. They're not actually related to pandas. They're not actually related to the great panda. But they do come from the, the same area. They come from the Himalayas in southwestern China. Uh, but at the Rotterdam Zoo, a red panda got out. And in order to find it, uh, it could have gotten anywhere in the city, so... Uh, the zoo officials uh, put out press releases in newspapers and on the radio, and people all over Rotterdam were told to keep an eye out for this red panda that's escaped and see if you can help the zookeepers find it. Well, the Rotterdam Zoo got hundreds of, of phone calls and reports of sightings of this red panda all over the city. 
Uh, so for dozens of miles in every direction, people th thought they saw or were convinced enough that they had seen the, the red panda uh, to call the Rotterdam Zoo and, and report a location. But the problem was these locations were nowhere close to each other. In fact, a few days later, unfortunately, they found that the red panda had been killed just about a block away from the zoo. So in fact, none of the sightings of the red panda were accurate. People were calling in saying they had seen the red panda, uh, which they clearly had not because it had not gotten more than a block away from the zoo. But because they were made to think about this particular animal, even if they didn't know exactly what it looked like, just a description of it and knowing that there's this animal out there. Whatever it is people were seeing may have been a cat, may have been a dog, may have been a fox or something else, but in their minds it was a red panda. So the actual facts that they were seeing, the data, the visual stimulus that they were taking in and interpreting uh, was based on something. They were actually seeing something out there in the real world, but the way they interpreted it was primed. It was connected with what they were thinking of at the time rather than strictly based on what they saw. A more recent example of this comes from this little doll, Mattel's Little Mommy Cuddling Coo, that uh, the doll will at random times make cooing noises and different kinds of uh, nonsense baby sounds. But when people listen to it, they started to think they heard something other than just random sounds. Listen to this now and tell me what you hear. <laughs> That sound came at the end of a series of babbling sounds, but it's those sounds that people focused on. And listen to it again and see if you can hear any specific words. At first, a few customers took the doll back to the store and demanded their money back because they said that they heard the phrase, either the phrase, Islam is the light, or Satan is king. Now, certain news outlets began to run the story and report the phrases Islam is the light and Satan is king. And once they did, a lot more parents started bringing their dolls back, uh, hearing the same words. Uh, listen one more time and see if you can hear either of those sentences. To me, the last syllable sounds a little bit like the word light. Uh, of course, it could also be delight. Uh, those last two syllables sounds more like delight than the light. But either delight or light, closer to any other words I can think of. But I, I certainly can't make out Islam in there anywhere. Listen to the first part of that without the last part. So that by itself, now listen to the whole thing again. And I should point out that this is again just the last of a long series of babbling sounds that the TV news spots selected. But if you're primed to think of one of those sentences, Islam is the light or Satan is king, and you anchor that speech pattern onto the actual sound of like the, the, like the sound that sounds like like, then your system one automatic cognition fills in the whole sentence into your memory around that one syllable. But what do those two things have in common? Satan is king and Islam is the light. Uh, would a pro-Muslim doll, even if uh, you think that there's a doll that is programmed to brainwash children into uh, believing, into converting to Islam, uh, would a pro-Muslim doll be worshiping Satan? Uh, Muslims regard Satan as the enemy just like Christians do. The only thing that Islam and Satan have to do with each other is that there are both things that scare the parents who get their news from these particular media companies. And remember that anxiety and the feeling of loss of control causes people to misperceive patterns in ambiguous data, uh, sights and sounds, visual information, auditory information. Uh, remember that study by Jennifer Whitson and Adam Galinsky at the University of Texas at Austin. They brought in managers and executives. The experimental group was asked to remember a time in their life when they had a project to complete and they could not finish it on time. Or they were unable to complete an assignment. And they were primed to think of a loss of control. Whereas the control group was primed to think of a time when they were in control, when they completed a task just fine, where they had control over a situation. The group that had been primed to think of a loss of control were much more likely to say that they saw a, some sort of pattern in this ambiguous black and white image in the center. 
uh, but there is no pattern in that image. But people who felt loss of control were more likely to misperceive patterns in this image. Whereas people who were primed to think of themselves as in control looked at the image and quite confidently said, I don't see anything there. Uh, this phenomenon of uh, seeing or hearing something scary in ambiguous information uh, was the subject of a, a movie a while back called White Noise, where people used to listen to the static on old landline telephones and say that they heard the voices of, of dead people. During the 70s and 80s, people, for some reason, ended up playing... Uh, rock music backwards and saying they heard satanic messages in it. And there's a, a humorous example of this in the other Michael Shermer talk. Uh, I assigned one Michael Shermer talk, a uh, TED talk, but if you watch the other one, uh, Why People Believe Strange Things, uh, he plays this, this Led Zeppelin song, Stairway to Heaven, uh, forward at first and then backwards, and he plays it backwards the first time, and you maybe hear one or two words, but then he shows you lyrics of what people have sort of parsed out. And when you're reading the lyrics, you can totally hear what you're reading in the sound. But again, you take the lyrics away and it's, it becomes more obvious that those uh, weren't actually words. They're just syllables that were matched with the closest scary word possible. But a big emphasis on the things that make us feel scared, anxious, or uh, like we're at a loss of control. Uh, this is one of the reasons why conspiracy theories see patterns that aren't there uh, because when we feel that someone else is taking control of our world away from us, we're much more likely to see uh, false patterns and in ambiguous information. But the point is, we can look at the same thing or listen to the same thing and hear very different things depending on the patterns that we have in our heads, the frames that we see those facts embedded in, uh, what we're primed to think of, what we see as coherent. Uh, all of these things, other than the facts themselves, cause us to do something with that fact, to make an inference that may or may not be justified by the actual fact, by the actual thing that we're perceiving. So to recap, remember the difference between a fact and an inference. A fact is independently verifiable information. It's something other people can go verify and see that, yes, what you see is actually there, what you hear is actually there. An inference is what you do with that fact. Uh, does that trigger an interpretation? Does it, is it something you define one way that somebody else might define a different way? Uh, do you immediately assume to know a cause, or do you guess about what caused those facts to be the way they are? Or are you afraid that those facts are an indication that some other thing is about to happen? Uh, does it make you want to uh, do something about it, or does it, is, does it inhibit you from doing something? Do you look at those facts and see them as good or bad? Do you see them as better or worse than other alternatives? All of these inferences are subsequent to the facts themselves, and they have just as much to do with the patterns that are in our own heads as they do with the things that are out there in the world that we're perceiving. Now, we have to make generalizations. We wouldn't be able to exist in the world. We wouldn't be able to learn anything if we weren't able to generalize from specific facts and predict new situations with similar facts may have other things in common. Uh, generalizing means forgetting some of the specifics of a fact in order to recognize it in a different connotation. But we don't want to overgeneralize because when we overgeneralize, we're no longer learning anything. We're now removing too much information from the facts. And when that overgeneralization becomes completely free of facts, when it's no longer falsifiable, when it's no longer testable, it becomes a platitude. The kind of thing, the kind of sentence that could be interpreted to mean something, but could also be interpreted to mean the opposite of that thing. In other words, the, it's so ambiguous that it really doesn't mean anything at all. So we want to generalize to a point, we want to generalize from specific facts, but don't carry those generalizations beyond what we can prove, beyond what we can test. And even if we're not very good at doing that, even if we're not very good at critical thinking and arguments of inquiry, uh, individually, even if we are sort of biased toward bias, uh, this is what peer review is for. Other people are going to be much better at being skeptical of our interpretations of the facts than we are going to be of ourselves. So peer review is your best source for facts that you haven't gathered yourself. But it's not perfect. Peer-reviewed articles have a lot more critical tests to pass before they get published than anything else published anywhere, including anything published in a newspaper uh, even a reputable newspaper or magazine or uh, TV news network. 
and facts, whether the facts we see ourselves or the facts we learn from reputable sources, always occur within a frame, and we typically are constantly being primed to interpret them one way or another. And we have to be aware, we're never going to be able to completely remove facts from frames. We're never going to be able to conceive of facts just completely isolated, the way artificial intelligence might. But critical thinking means even though you've got that initial frame, you become aware of that frame and you become aware of how that frame is influencing you. Or you become aware of that priming effect. And you become aware of what inferences are already there in your automatic cognition. And the fact that they're already there doesn't mean you're stuck with them. You can put them to the side and say, okay, those are the most obvious inferences, but what other inferences are out there? And could they be tested as well?